Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. In our last lesson, we finished studying chapter 9 of the Gospel of Luke. That chapter ended with Jesus having a brief conversation with three men. He gave each of them a short parable that dealt with the issue that was keeping them from following him. Let's jump right into chapter 10 that flows out of what happened in the closing scenes of chapter 9. Chapter 10, verse 1, sets the stage for what happens next. After this, the Lord appointed seventy-two others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. This happened after Jesus was rejected by a Samaritan village. Afterwards, he went to a nearby village of Samaritans to lodge for the night and they must have received him since we have no record of this event being repeated. We don't know where Jesus sent these disciples off from and what village he would meet them at afterwards. Since Luke is the only gospel writer to record this event, we have nowhere else to turn for more information. The King James Version wrote that Jesus sent out 70 disciples, while most modern translations read 72. The difference is over the source material the translators used. Newer translations have older and better manuscripts to refer to in order to have more accurate translations. I don't think that 70 verses 72 is a big deal one way or another. This might upset the King James only crowd and those who read older commentaries which I happen to like. Many of these commentators really like numerology and flinging numbers around. They had a heyday over Jesus sending out 70 disciples and made all kinds of comparisons to it. They would certainly be crestfallen if they knew that the number more than likely was 72, but the number 70 is a special number in the Bible. The important thing is that Jesus sent out the disciples in groups of two. This is very practical. He did the same thing just on a smaller scale when he sent out the twelve apostles at an earlier date. Some of the reasons why he sent them out two by two was to teach them how to work with each other in preaching the good news. This way, they could be a comfort and support to each other and a source of encouragement in times of persecution or through other difficult situations. This also would be a safeguard to help them walk holy if temptation came their way, for two are stronger than one. Another aspect of this is that the Mosaic Law teaches that out of the mouths of two witnesses, everything might be established. Two men proclaiming the miracles of Jesus would only confirm the truthfulness of their claim. As they began working with each other to preach the gospel of the kingdom, they would learn how to let the Holy Spirit flow through them with each operating in his gifts. Yet the most important reason for them going out in groups of two was because Jesus commanded it, and this should be the same with us today. Another point of this verse I want to address is that the Lord appointed 72 others, or as the King James Version refers to it, 70 others. There has been a lot of speculation on what the others refer to, but it seems to me that most of them are sheer speculation. I think that there are only two reasonable options. The first is that the others refer to the apostles that Jesus sent out at an earlier time in his ministry. From this idea, the twelve would have stayed back with Jesus to help him and continue to be prepared by him for the time when they would become the first leaders of the primitive church. Second, it could be an inference that this wasn't the first time Jesus sent out a large group of disciples after giving them the power and authority to heal the sick, cast out devils, and preach the good news. Jesus was preparing his disciples for the time when he would be taken from them, and it makes a lot of sense that he sent out other groups of disciples for some serious on-the-job training. The final point I want to make from verse 1 comes out of the fact that Jesus sent them ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. This is different from what Jesus did when he sent out the twelve, and we see this in Luke chapter 9, verse 6, where they went from village to village preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. The seventy-two were sent to prepare the way in the villages where Jesus would soon be ministering, while the twelve were sent out without any restriction on where to go, but needed to be led by the Holy Spirit. Since this was our Lord's final trek to Jerusalem, and given that his time was short, he was speeding things up by sending out the 72 to prepare the people for his coming. His popularity was growing very fast, and this would also set in motion the events that were soon to take place in Jerusalem. Being sent out like this was excellent training for these men. 
They had the best teaching that could ever be given, and that came directly from Jesus. They had watched Him preach and perform miracles, and now it was time to put their training to use. We learn from this that it's not wrong to train up leaders, but we must look a little closer at how the Master did this and follow more closely His example. I think that Christian colleges are missing it, that they are being so corrupted by the woke culture and secular psychology that the very reason people are trained for ministry is being lost. Jesus didn't run a college to give out higher degrees, but a discipleship ministry that was about character development so that the students could become like the teacher. We see in the following verses what Jesus taught the 72 just before sending them out, and this wasn't the first time he taught these truths either. We could think of this like a pep talk or a refresher sermon to help the 72 keep their focus and help them to go by faith in the power of Jesus' name. The Lord told them in verse 2, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. To help us understand what Jesus is teaching here, we need to understand why he came into the world. He told us in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Why was Jesus sending out the seventy-two? To seek the lost and bring them to the Savior. They were preparing people to meet their God. This is the mission of the church, to go and make disciples of all nations, that Jesus would eventually tell the disciples when they were on the mountain after his resurrection, and this is found in Matthew 28. Jesus was striving to burn into their hearts and minds the mission, his mission that was soon to become their mission. Most of the church today has lost sight of the mission, while many churches and Christians don't even know why they exist. Other churches and denominations have mutated into a social institution that doesn't resemble the true church in any way, shape, or form. Jesus was telling those disciples to open their eyes so that they could see the fields are ripe for harvest. When we see this fact, then we must also come to understand that the labors in this harvest are few. How can we have so many churches in this nation with so few salvations, true salvations? Not people raising their hand in church to a cutesy talk or reading a card at their front door and then praying a written prayer. I'm talking about true radical conversions that makes bona fide disciples whose lives are revolutionized because they have been delivered from the bondage of sin and death. When the biblical standard of salvation is lowered and what it means to be born again has morphed into a worthless idea, we have reduced in the minds of church folk the absolute necessity of salvation and that it's radical. This is why people can be living in sin while still thinking that they are Christian, even though the Word of God boldly states the exact opposite. The 72 weren't sent to preach a watered-down social gospel that makes people feel good about themselves but to preach the truth of the good news that convicts people of sin and liberates them from its devilish bondage. We need people that will go to the lost and preach the uncompromising gospel, to seek after the worst of the worst and show them there's a remedy to their sin-sick souls. Where are these messengers sent from God that are redeemed saints laying down their lives for the glory of God? This greatest of all callings is being offered to each of us, that we prepare people to meet their God so that they might obtain His mercy and not incur His wrath. Jesus gave these men a command, and He's giving us this same command today. He said in verse 3, Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. The first thing we must see is the command to go. He gave this command in Matthew 28, verse 19, that I just referenced a moment ago. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. This is also recorded in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. This is the reason why the baptism of the Holy Spirit was given to the church, as Jesus declared in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There's so much more that the New Testament teaches about this obligation to go that's given to all true followers of Jesus. We are put under divine obligation to proclaim to a world rushing to hell that there's a Savior and His name is Jesus, that there is no other name under heaven by which people can be saved. This truth about being sent by God is prophesied about in the Old Testament. We see this in such verses as Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, where the Lord said, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. 
Here is the privilege to go as an ambassador for Christ and take his salvation to the ends of the earth. Isaiah was given a phenomenal privilege of seeing the glory of God and the beauty and terror of his holiness. This is found in Isaiah chapter 6. The Lord overwhelmed the prophet with his holiness, then terrified him with the horrendous evil of his sinfulness. Then he showed the seer the gross sins of the people, and the man was undone in God's presence. In mercy, an angel took a hot bloody coal off the altar of sacrifice, touched his mouth, and cleansed him from sin. That hot bloody coal also set a holy fire in this man. And that bloody blazing coal symbolizes Jesus and his atoning sacrifice. Immediately after the prophet was cleansed of sin, he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? After being cleansed of his sin, Isaiah was then obligated to accept the call of God. He cried out, Here I am, send me, because the fire of God began to burn in his soul. Now he couldn't keep silent. He couldn't turn a deaf ear to the cries of the people in their sin, and he couldn't remain blind to the people that were rushing towards judgment. The very next thing the Lord told Isaiah is found in verse 9, Go and tell this people. The message he was given to speak, Jesus quoted, and it was, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. The mass of people that heard Jesus preach and saw his miracles had grown hard to the reality of their sin, refused to believe that Jesus was Messiah, and that there was a day of judgment. The seventy-two would face the same thing, and that's why Jesus said, Go, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. They would face enemies that would want to tear them to pieces like wolves would do to an innocent lamb. Their enemies would want to silence them in any way possible. But they were to go nonetheless, because the fields were ripe for harvest, even in spite of the persecution that they would experience. Jesus taught them that there would be suffering along the way from persecution and hardships, but they were to be like innocent lambs in a world of wolves. Not so that they would be mercilessly devoured, but so they could act like the Lamb of God and lay down their lives so that others can know the joy of true salvation. We are forbidden to respond to hate, prejudice, and maltreatment like the world does, where they retaliate in like kind. Our example is Jesus, and how he suffered is how we are to suffer, and this is why we must be good students of the Word so that we know how he lived and died. And this is why we need to be a people of prayer, because we are called to live a life that can't be attained through natural strength, fortitude, or talent. We need to be strong in the grace of God, for this is how we can become more like Jesus in heart, life, word, and action. Such a life is thoroughly unattainable without an active, vibrant life of prayer. Some of the instructions Jesus gave the seventy-two are similar to what he gave the twelve when they were sent out. The opening account of Luke chapter 9 is about Jesus sending out the apostles to preach and perform signs and wonders. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record Jesus sending out the twelve, but only Luke records sending out the seventy-two. Matthew gives the largest account of Jesus teaching the twelve before sending them out, and that takes up all of chapter 10. Luke and Mark give roughly the same amount of attention to Jesus sending out the apostles. Luke gives twenty-four verses to the subject of Jesus sending out the seventy-two, and the last four verses contain a short prayer of thanksgiving Jesus offered to the Father over the seventy-two being faithful to their calling. In both the twelve and the seventy-two, Jesus gave power and authority to heal the sick and preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Luke doesn't record that Jesus gave them power to cast out devils, but this is clearly implied in verse 17 where the seventy-two returned with joy and said, Lord, even demons submit to us in your name. In Luke chapter 10, verse 4, Jesus told the seventy-two, Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. I don't think Jesus was telling the disciples to go barefoot, but to not take anything extra with them. To the twelve, Jesus specifically told them to not take an extra bag, staff, tunic, money, or bread. It seems like Jesus was giving the seventy-two the same command. The reason for this command of the seventy-two may have had a dimension to it that wasn't necessary when Jesus sent out the twelve. There appears to be an urgency in sending out the seventy-two, since the time was nearing for Jesus to go to Jerusalem and be sacrificed. The king was sending out his ambassadors on an urgent mission, and they were to travel light so that they could go quickly. This is the reason for the injunction that they were not to greet anyone on the road so that their mission would not be delayed. Time was of the essence, and the seventy-two needed to keep their mission at the forefront of their minds. 
Both the twelve and seventy-two were to travel in this way, so that they would learn how to trust the Lord to take care of them when they were busy about His business. Similar to the twelve, the seventy-two were to stay in whatever home that they were welcomed. He didn't want them to move from house to house within a village to find the best accommodations. Theirs was a mission of love and mercy to whosoever would receive their persons and message. They were not to use their calling to gain position, fame, or prosperity. They were to go where they were welcomed, and to stay as long as they were welcomed, until they were to preach in another village or return at the master's appointed time. They were to eat whatever food was set before them, whether it came from a poor man's house or that of a wealthy merchant. They were to be thankful for what the Lord supplied through these people and not sin through complaining. Jesus told the disciples in verses 5 and 6, When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. In whatever house they entered, they were to immediately bless that house so that the inhabitants would know they came in peace and goodwill. The peace they could give was the peace they received from Jesus after becoming one of his disciples. This peace was first and foremost positional peace, and this has to do with their making peace with God through repentance, obedience, and surrender. Through their positional peace, they would have internal peace, and this is tranquility of spirit that comes through getting right with God. We can only give what we possess, and for the disciples to give their peace to a home, they had to be at peace with God and with each other. If there was contention between disciples, then God's peace wouldn't be resting on them, so they wouldn't have His peace to bless others with. If we are to preach the gospel, then we need to be living it out and letting God's peace define our lives. To take their peace back from those who rejected their message was done according to their word, and the Lord would honor the word of His messengers by taking His peace from that person, house, or village. In either giving or taking back God's peace, we see another expression of authority that God gives the believer. It's similar to Elijah, who was given authority to stop rain and dew from falling on Israel, and then at his word, it would fall again. The power to perform such a miracle came from God, and he had given the prophet the authority to operate through his power, and the Lord honored his act of faith and obedience. Jesus told the 72 that a worker deserves his wages. What was the business they were in? Of winning souls to Christ. What were the wages they would receive? Of course, eternal life but their needs need to be taken care of. Jesus is teaching that the preaching of the gospel is a noble and blessed occupation where the worker deserves the wages for his service. It's right for preachers of the gospel to be paid a good wage for their labor, and it's wrong for any church to deny their pastor an adequate salary for serving them. To keep a pastor in poverty is wrong, and it's equally as wrong for a pastor to seek to get rich off the gospel. Ministers are to be content with their wages and not grumble because they aren't getting what they think they deserve. The church should be taking care of their pastor's needs so that he has no occasion to grumble to God over the stinginess of the congregation. Jesus told the 72 in verse 9 to heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near. One point I want to make on this is that we must have something of substance to give the people so that they would know that the preaching of the kingdom of God is the truth. I'm not talking about making rice Christians, which is a term that relates to people becoming Christian in name only, that they might get some food and support from a missionary. And I don't think that Jesus is telling the church to build hospitals in the mission field to win the lost, though I'm not condemning it and know that it can be a good ministry. Jesus was instructing the disciples to operate through supernatural power, not through the wisdom of man or the power of medicine. We need to be compassionate over the suffering people face through sickness, disease, and the ravages of war, and medical attention has its place. Yet it's the miraculous that will grab hold of people's attention so that they will listen to the message of repentance and salvation. Jesus gave the 72 some instructions on how to deal with being rejected by people or even an entire village. We find this in verses 10-11. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that sticks to your feet we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I would imagine that Jesus gave some clarity to these instructions, which could either be done out of anger or compassion. Why is it important that the disciples do this when rejected by a family or village? It was a prophetic act that warned the people of divine judgment if they didn't repent. In our culture, such an act would have little effect. But in that ancient culture and ones that are similar today, 
To shake the dust off your feet was a perfect act that the people understood. To do this out of anger from personal offense would void the act itself. But to do it through compassion as Jesus wept over Jerusalem may touch some proud, stubborn people. The idea of this authority is further expressed in verse 16, where Jesus said, He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. When we belong to Jesus and have become an ambassador of the King of Kings, then what is done to the ambassador is done to the one who sent him. His people may not see immediate retribution for the crimes that are committed against God by abusing his messengers, but it will come in time. The Lord delays such judgment so that some might be saved. But the spiritual law that we reap what we sow is an absolute. When people reject us, they are not only rejecting Jesus, but the Father as well. This is only to be expected since the Lord our God is one. This idea also shows how precious the saints are to the Lord, where He takes personally any wrongs done to them. On the flip side, if a glass of water is given to one of His servants, He takes it as being given to Him. The importance of faithfully preaching God's Word is seen in the statement, He who listens to you listens to me. When the Word of God is spoken by His servants, it's as if Jesus is speaking to them. Therefore, we must represent Him well. When the Word of His servants are rejected, they have rejected Jesus, who is the Word. And when people receive the Word joyfully, they are receiving Jesus and the Father. This is a serious dose of responsibility and authority, so we need to be faithful ambassadors of the King of Kings. The serious nature of God recompensing those who reject and abuse His disciples is seen in verse 12. I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day for Sodom than for that town. The day Jesus is referring to is a day of judgment, and this is proved by what He said in verse 14, which we will get to shortly. The people of Sodom lived wicked, sexually perverted lives, but they didn't hear the preaching of Jesus or see any of His miracles. Though their judgment was just, their guilt isn't as great as those who heard Jesus preach and saw His miracles, yet rejected Him. None of us understand how God judges other than what we are told in Scripture. His judgments are always perfect because they are based upon absolute truth. Opinions have no place in God's judgment because He's omniscient, which means that He knows everything there is to know and there's no end to His knowledge. He knows the heart, mind, and motives of every person and judges them according to the light that they had. Sodom didn't have God's word to instruct them, but they did have a God-given conscience that they grossly violated. They were judged as lawbreakers because they knew the basics of right and wrong and refused to be governed by it. Those who saw and heard Jesus were given a tremendous privilege and became accountable for the truth that was given to them. The same is true for Christ's messengers who preach the good news. Those who hear the message are accountable to God for the truth that they have been given. The message they preach offers the hope of salvation and freedom from the consequences of sin. That same message holds divine judgments for those who reject the truth to continue believing lies. Jesus pronounced judgment on three Galilean cities where He performed many miracles and did much preaching. They are Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. We see this in verses 13 through 15. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. In verse 12, Jesus said that it would be more tolerable on the day of judgment for Sodom than those who reject the preaching of his disciples. In verses 15-13, through 13, the judgment will come upon the cities Jesus preached at because they rejected the Savior's ministry to them. Jesus proclaimed that a similar judgment would fall upon Jerusalem and the entire nation for rejecting the day of God's coming to them. The judgment on Chorazin is interesting because we have no account of Jesus preaching or doing miracles in that city. From what Jesus said, it must have been a city of some importance for Him to do many miracles there. Eusebius of Caesarea, a Christian theologian and historian from the 3rd and 4th centuries, claimed that the city was two miles from Capernaum. All that's left of it is a pile of rubble. Bethsaida, which is a city east of the Jordan and west of the Sea of Galilee, is where Andrew, Peter, and Philip were raised. It's a site where Jesus fed 5,000 men, a crowd of possibly 20,000 if women and children were added to that number. 
Jesus must have done much preaching there and performed many miracles, so their rejection of Messiah was great. Capernaum was the home base of Christ's ministry for a time, and there are some prominent miracles that took place in that city, yet the majority of people refused to follow Jesus. Tyre is the celebrated commercial city of the Phoenicians and was about 20 miles south of Sidon. It was probably a larger city than Jerusalem in Christ's day and was exceedingly wicked, being immersed in idolatry. This pagan city was frequently denounced by the prophets who predicted its final destruction. Sidon was a sister city to Tyre and was also an extremely wicked heathen city. Its ruin was not as complete as Tyre's, but it was still laid waste. The point Jesus made is that the heathen cities of Tyre and Sidon will have a less severe judgment than the three Jewish cities he denounced because to whom much is given, much is required. Tyre and Sidon were ruined by commercial prosperity, while Sodom was destroyed over sexual perversions. Yet the sin of rejecting Messiah is greater than the sins those heathen cities committed. Preaching the gospel must never be taken lightly or flippantly, for it's serious work to preach the truth. The accountability of the preacher is real, and that of the listener is no less serious. The Word of God is a treasure that gives true wealth to those who believe, and it's a sword for those who reject the truth. I want to close with asking a question and then answering it. If divine judgment falls upon those who hear the gospel after rejecting the message, would it be better to not preach the gospel, which makes people more guilty before God? Absolutely not since the condition of all people is that they are under divine wrath because they are lawbreakers who are sinners by nature and by choice. The preaching of the gospel doesn't make innocent people guilty, for mankind isn't innocent, and they are already guilty for their willful sin and sin nature. The preaching of the gospel is the mercy of God revealed to hell-deserving sinners, where they are given opportunity to repent and turn to Christ. Yes, to reject the gospel when offered to them does make them more guilty. But without it preached to them, they would have no opportunity to be saved. It's the love and mercy of God that He sends out His ambassadors to share the good news that Jesus saves. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill.